this day. We thank you for uh, everything you've done for us. Thank you for what you're continuing to do in leading us and guiding us, feeding us with your hand. We bless you in the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. All right, so today um, we're going to have uh, a really good teaching, a key to freedom. It's called Your Way to Freedom. Um, the pathway of life versus the pathway of iniquity. And I put this up just because iniquity is not something that's really been taught well. And I want you to see the notes from the blog um, about the twin snakes of iniquity. Just so you can, if you're taking notes, you can write these things down. Um, but first, we're going to actually... Shut this off and look at the scriptures. The first question. Mm -hmm. um, so this, the subject is your way to freedom. Everybody say my way to freedom. My way to freedom. Your way to freedom is the path of life. There's two paths. There's the path of life and the path of iniquity. Today is um, April 2nd. And so, on the Sabbath day, we always read a proverb with the family. And so we're reading Proverbs 2, because today is the second. And in the middle of that chapter, it talks about um, walking in the midst of the paths of judgment. When you love wisdom and understanding, you'll find the paths of judgment and discretion. discretion. And Proverbs talks about these things. It talks about the path of life, the path of wisdom. And there's two paths in life. The path of life in the path of iniquity, the pathway of life versus the pathway of iniquity. And once we become born again, once we repent, once we have faith in Jesus Christ, okay, once we are baptized in water, once we are filled with the Holy Ghost, we have the power, the grace, the ability to walk away from the path of iniquity and get on the path of life. And there's a very specific path to life. There's a very specific pathway of iniquity. And so we're going to talk about these pathways. So the first question is, what is iniquity? Iniquity um, is the driver for sin. It's the fuel for sin. You know, uh, we've talked about this uh, before. This has like been a theme in the past couple of weeks that God is leading us through. But the iniquity is the fuel for sin. The sin is the symptom. It's the sneeze. It's the cough. Okay, it's the disease. Okay, it's the symptom of the disease. Iniquity is the virus. Iniquity is the thing that causes the pain. Iniquity is the thing that causes the sickness, which brings the symptom. Okay, so iniquity is the cause. Sin is the result. Iniquity is the cancer. Okay, sin is the sickness. Okay, so iniquity is the inner thing that causes the outer um, disobedience. Mm. And we discussed this. Um, what is keeping yourself from your iniquity? There is um, the first scripture we're going to look at is Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. It says, You should not make unto thee, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. We're not supposed to make any three dimensional images of animals, birds, fish, bugs, anything. Thou shalt not bow thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, Yahuwah, thy Elohim. Am a jealous Elohim, visiting the what? Iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So the first way to defeat iniquity is keeping the second commandment, basically not to have any graven images or any idolatry. And why is that? Because when you have a graven image, when you put that in your possession or in your 
or you mix, you start to mix your worship with idolatry, it shows hatred for God's order. It shows hatred for his commandment. It shows hatred for his authority. And he gives mercy to those that actually love him and keep his commandment. Okay? So, keeping yourself from your iniquity, the first step of keeping yourself from your iniquity is to keep the second commandment. Okay? And notice one thing he said in the scripture that um, when we walk in idolatry, don't do it. And the warning is because he visits the iniquity of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation. So you can look back to your parents, your great-grandparents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, okay, and see what, what kind of things they suffer from. And notice that those things are going to visit you, okay? If they had divorce, if they had... Uh, drunkenness, if they had, you know, unbelief, if they had, you know, if they were, you know, witches, or if they did voodoo, or if they did any of these things, or if they just had, you know, any type of iniquities, that, that same iniquity is going to visit you, okay, and if you keep his, if you're a believer born again, and you keep his commandments, you're not going to let that iniquity in, so even when the iniquity visits you, you don't have to let it in the door. You don't have to open the door to the iniquity of your fathers. Jeremiah 33, verse 8. <clears throat> Jeremiah 33, verse 8. And we talked about this a, a couple weeks back. We're just going through a quick review. It says, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. So notice the iniquity is the whereby they sin. The iniquity is the fuel for the sin. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities. So he's not only going to cleanse them from their iniquity, he's going to pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have transgressed against me. Titus 2, another scripture, says what he's going to do for our iniquities. He said, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that we might, he might redeem us from all iniquity. So Jesus Christ redeems us from iniquity. He redeems us from the things that cause us to sin. He redeems us from the inner, um, the, the cancers, the viruses that cause us to sin spiritually. That he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So once you're redeemed from your iniquity, you can purify. You become purified and zealous for good works. 2 Timothy 2, 19. Going through real quick because it's a review. <laughs> Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. Everybody say seal. seal. There's a seal, okay, in the foundation of God, the foundation of God's kingdom. There's a seal. And this seal says this. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So it's not just, oh, I just prayed a prayer, and I'm good. No, the seal is not that you prayed the prayer or that you went down to the church and you said, oh, I believe in Jesus Christ. The seal is that the Lord knows those that are his. <laughs> and that let him that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So there's a departure from iniquity that comes in Christ. We have to depart from iniquity. We have to depart not just from our sin, but from the inner inequities that drive our sin. We have to depart. We have to stop feeding the sin. We have to stop feeding the sin. And so this is a summary of what the scriptures says that the Yah is going to do for our iniquities. So when our iniquities visit from our forefathers, we cannot open the door for them. Why? Because we are keeping the commandments of God and we will have mercy. So we don't have to open the door for the iniquities that come from our forefathers. When we keep Yah's commandments, Yah's mercy cleanses our iniquities. Number one, number one. then two, it pardons our iniquities. The Yahusha, our Messiah, redeems us from our iniquities and purifies us to be zealous for good works. And we are also called to depart from our iniquity and keep ourselves 
from our iniquities. So our way to freedom is the pathway of life. The pathway of life versus the path. It's away from the path of iniquity to the pathway of life. Okay? So this is just an introduction. I want you to understand what iniquity is and how important it is. Okay? Because and I'm laying this foundation because these things are not really discussed too much. Okay, we don't have an understanding of iniquity. Like when you read the Bible, they throw around this word and you're just like, what is that? Right? You don't really understand what it is. But this this thing is very important. If if it wasn't important, it wouldn't be mentioned in all these crucial scriptures. You know, these scriptures are crucial to the foundation of the covenant and crucial to the foundation of the gospel. And so the iniquity part is something that needs to be taught on because there's a lot that th of things that come from iniquity. Okay? So now, now that we've laid that foundation of how we are set free from our iniquities, how we can close the door to our iniquities, how the mercy of God can set us free um, set us free from iniquity. How we can be cleansed from our iniquity, pardoned from our iniquity, uh, redeemed from our iniquity, purified, right? And to depart from our iniquity. Now let's talk about what deeper, let's talk a little bit deeper about what iniquity actually looks like. And we're going to go into some scriptural examples as well. So I'm going to the blog, The Twin Snakes of Iniquity on SelfSpression.com. These ten twin snakes of uh, iniquity are doubt and pride. Okay, so iniquity is like six twins of Satan. <laughs> he has six twins, right? The Bible says that Satan is the father of lies, right? And these iniquities are three sets of twin lies that Satan has fathered. And we're going to look at these, these lies from... The scriptural perspective from the very beginning when Satan first came on the scene. So doubt and pride are the first set of twins. Doubt means you don't believe God. Okay? When you don't believe that God will do what he said he'll do. When you don't believe that God will help you. You don't believe that God has the best in mind for you. Then that's doubt. That's the first iniquity. You notice that what the first what's the first thing that um, the Satan said to Eve, Yea, have God said, right? He's putting doubt in her mind. That's the first twin, the first twin of Satan that came out. Okay? And then, the next, uh, the next, the next one that came out was pride. Okay, when you don't believe God, what's the next thing you have to believe in? Yourself. Okay, when you don't believe God, doubt doesn't believe God, and pride believes in yourself. Okay, so the first thing that Eve had to do when, when Satan questioned God's word and put doubt in her mind, she said, hmm, God is keeping something from me to keep me from being wise, to keep me from having what I need. And so then she refused to believe in God and immediately she started to believe in herself. Not believing in what God told her, but believing in herself separately from God's instructions. That's doubt and pride. Envy. The next set of twins that, that Satan spawned <laughs> is envy and lust. Envy is not being thankful for what God gave you. You want some what somebody else has. Okay? Lust is desiring what God gave somebody else. Envy is when you, you're looking at what somebody else has been given and you want it because you're not thankful for what God gave to you. And then lust is that desire. For the things that somebody else has. The third set of twins. The Satan spawn. The twins of iniquity. Are bitterness and rebellion. Bitterness is being angry about your place. In God's order. Okay. You've been made one thing. You want to be something else. Right. Um, 
You're the first brother, you want to be the, la the baby brother. You're the baby brother, you want to be the, the, the firstborn, right? You see that in the Bible, okay? You're a woman, you want to be the man. You're a father, you want to be a leader. You're a farmer, you want to be a shepherd. You're a shepherd, you want to be a farmer, right? These are the examples that the scripture shows. You're the king, you're not the king, you want to be the king, right? You're the prophet, <laughs> you want to be the king. You're the king, you want to be the priest. Right? These are the examples the scripture shows. Even we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, when Saul was impatient because he had to wait for Samuel. Okay, He tried to do it on his own. And so bitterness goes to rebellion. When you're not comfortable with your place in God's order. And then you start to walk in rebellion and say, you know what? S since God didn't make me that, I'm going to do that anyway. I'm going to do what I want. I'm not going to wait. And that's how Saul became a witch because the Bible says that rebellion is as a sin of what? Witchcraft. Witchcraft. Okay, so these iniquities are key. Because the reason why they're key, we have to understand them because they are the key to so many things in Scripture. Understanding the iniquities will help us to be free from our iniquity, help us to depart from our iniquity. Why? Because the Scripture says, let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's in this, that's the new covenant, right? Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And that's not been taught. We've been taught just pray to prayer and hope that, you know, one day you'll learn something. Maybe if you get filled with the Holy Ghost, then maybe you'll, and then people get filled with the Holy Ghost and they still walk in iniquity. Because they haven't, they've been taught, they haven't been taught the seal. The seal is the Lord knows those that are his. And let him that name it the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The seal of the foundation of God has not been taught. Why? Because we don't understand what iniquity is. Okay, so bitterness is being angry about your place in God's order. Rebellion is acting in subversion because of your dissatisfaction with your place in God's order. Other terms for iniquities. Doubt that can be called fear. Okay, there's a fear of God, but there's a fear of that's based in doubt. Oh, God's not going to provide for me if I obey him. Oh, God's not going to... Um, I don't believe that God's going to help me or support me. I don't believe that if I trust, if I do what God said, it's going to work out. That brings fear in your heart. Okay? So that's another term for it. That's why um, he said fear is an abomination. Right? So unbelief, doubt, fear, unbelief, lack of trust. Laziness and slothfulness. Okay? The Bible says, be not slothful, but believing. Right? Why? Because when you move slow, the reason why you move slow is because you don't believe. When you're lazy, the reason why you're lazy is because you have doubt that it's going to work. I have, I have doubt that if I do what I'm supposed to do, it's going to work out. So I'm just going to wait, waste time. Okay? The core of slothfulness is unbelief, is doubt that God will reward your work. The Bible says that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So when you're not diligent, what are you doing? You're not diligent because you have doubt. Okay. What are other terms for um, pride? Okay. You don't believe in God, then you start to what? Believe in yourself. Because you don't believe in God, now you have to start believing in yourself outside of obedience to God. So what is the other term for pride? Other terms for pride is vanity. Okay? When you're vain and you start to, instead of trusting in how the natural beauty that God gave you, you start to be vain and start to try to enhance your beauty in vain ways. Coolness. Okay? When you don't have confidence in the talent that God is giving you, you start to try to supplement with coolness and pride, okay? And haughtiness, okay? Conceitedness, focus on self-ideation. A lot of people don't understand. They say, well, somebody's conceited. Well, the reason why they're conceited is you have to look up what conceit a conceit is. A conceit is actually an idea. There's, no, there's such thing as a good idea. These are good conceits. But when somebody is wise in their own conceits that means they're so focused on their own ideas that they don't have time to obey God 
they don't have time to obey what and do what God said because they've got so much creativity and so many ideas. That's that's being wise in your own conceits, and that's a form of pride when you have so many ideas because you can't fathom obeying God. You can't fathom submitting to His ways. You can't fathom believing Him and doing what He said because it's not going to work. So you got to come up with your own ideas, your own conceits. Okay. Other words for envy, jealousy, discontent, okay, subversion, group zeal. When you become so envious of what somebody else has, you start to have wrath. And we see that in Cain, right? We see that in Cain. Cain was a, a farmer, or he was, he, the Bible says he kept, he tilled the tiller of the ground. He was a tiller of the ground, and God would bless him with fruit, Okay. But the worship of God was set forth for the sacrifice of blood. Okay? And he had to sacrifice a lamb to worship God. But, uh-oh, Cain, wasn't a, Cain didn't have any sheep. He wasn't a shepherd. He was a tiller. But instead of trying to worship God the way he wanted to, he was envious of his brother, who was a shepherd. And instead of taking his first fruits of his crops and giving a tithe to his brother, who was a shepherd... And so they could sacrifice a lamb together. Cain wanted to do it all on his own. You know, he wanted to form a, a group of tillers and, and farmers that would worship God on their own by themselves without shepherds. Right? And so he was full of envy, and that envy led him into lust. Okay? He had that lust, um, and he ended up killing his brother because of his lust for his brother's life. So envy, when you're jealous of somebody else, you're jealous of their, of who they are, or you're jealous of what, what they have, and you're discontent with what God has given you, it leads you into lust, okay? Wrath, lust for someone else's life, lust for someone else's wife, lust for someone else's car, lust for someone else's money, lust for someone else's status or position, okay? Um, excessive ambition, okay? Lust is covetousness. Lust is gluttony. Lust is excessive ambition. Okay? When you're envious of what somebody else has, then you start to try to bring more to yourself. I believe the word Cain even means to, to, to acquire. Right? So, his, so God was going to bless him with all the crops he needed. But instead of being satisfied with that, he wanted, he wanted the shepherd's job too. He, he wasn't satisfied, and so he he lusted after his brother's position, and he didn't want to he didn't want to submit to the order of God. Okay, um, excessive excessive ambition, strife, debate, self promotion, and selfishness. When you want to lift yourself up above others, that comes from envy, because you want what someone else has. Okay, then we have. Other words for bitterness are unforgive, unforgiveness, gall, sourness in spirit, a neg negative attitude towards obedience. Bitterness, gall, sourness. You know, you just have a bad attitude towards your place in life. You're not satisfied with who you are, where you are, and what God has given to you. And that's kind of what, um, it's another look at what Cain because God had given him a warning and said, Hey, Cain, I'll accept your offering if you do what's right. Okay? But instead of deciding to heed the warning from God, speaking directly to him, he decided to, to continue down the pathway of iniquity. And that pathway of iniquity led him to bitterness. And then he ended up murdering his brother. So he went from envy to lust, to bitterness, and it just became more and more depressed, and, and then he murdered his brother. Okay? So what are the other terms for bitterness? Unforgiveness, gall, sourness in spirit, a negative attitude towards obedience. Even when God told tell you what to do, you still have a negative attitude towards, towards it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to give that tithe to my brother. Nope. I'm gonna nope. My my offering should be good enough for you, God. I don't have to work with my brother. I'm giving you. I work hard for all these crops, and I'm just gonna give you these crops directly, <laughs> right? 
And so, um, then you got rebellion. What are other terms for rebellion? Witchcraft, self-will, impatience, disorder. Okay? When you have bitterness about something that happened to you or bitterness to your place in life, right? You don't want to submit to God's order. You don't want to submit to God's protocol. So you become rebellious. You want to take your own position. You want to take your own status. You want to take take your own something. You want to take something by force that God did not give to you. Okay. And it turns into witchcraft. It turns into self-will. Just like when Saul wouldn't wait for Samuel. All right, I'm just going to do it myself. I'm just going to do this sacrifice. I'm not waiting for Samuel. I'm just going to do this sacrifice myself right now because that's what the people want. I'm going to give the people what they want. Okay? Out of impatience, I'm going to usurp authority and walk in disorder because of my impatience, because of my bitterness that I'm not the one that God chose to do that. Okay? So that's the pathway of iniquity. And when we are redeemed from iniquity, we need to what? Depart. From iniquity. Amen? Amen? I know this is a hard teaching, but, you know, we got to dig into it and just all search, search our hearts. You know, every one of us, we have to search. Uh, once we can march down this pathway of iniquity and depart from everyone, Amen. we're going to see the freedom in Christ just rise. Because there's so many people that have been reading the Bible, going to church, Know that Israelite, know that whatever, filled with the Holy Ghost, but still bound to these iniquities. And they wonder why they cannot rise, mm. right? They wonder why they can't obey God. They wonder why their life doesn't progress. I'm here to tell you that your key to freedom is in the pathway of life and departing from the pathway of iniquity. And when we look at these scriptures that have been in the scriptures this whole time that we never understood, we never understood these things. I was never taught these things. I never... Matter of fact, when you start to understand these iniquities, every single story in the Bible contains them. Like, every one. Like, you begin to see, like, oh, that's oh, that's pride that leads to this, this leads to bitterness. And oh, yeah, he dealt with that. And then, and then you start to see what God is saying through all these scriptures. These are the people that departed from iniquity. These are the people that went in the pathway of iniquity. These are the people that went into the pathway of forgiveness. These are the people that went to the pathway of obedience. Okay? And the whole scripture just become alive because you can see the heart. And once you start to see the heart, now you start to get into the new covenant because the new covenant is a heart covenant. And so that's why the Bible says the foundation of God standeth sure. The Lord knows them that are his. The Lord knows. You don't know. The Lord knows those that are his. There's lots of people that will prophesy and cast out devils and do great works. But he's going to say, I never knew you. Right? Because you what? Then what do you say after that? You that worked what? Iniquity. Iniquity. I'm not. This is not a joke. <laughs> this is not just some... Me found, found out something new and I'm trying to feel, sound like I'm smart. This is the key to your freedom. Why? Because there's many people that say they believed in Jesus. Doing miracles, signs and wonders. Prophesying, doing great works. And he's going to say, I never knew you. I never knew you. You did not do the will of my Father in heaven. Depart from me, you that worked what? Iniquity. The seal of God. The foundation of God have, have stand as sure. Having this seal, right? This seal. The Lord knows them that are his. And let he that nameth the name of Christ depart from what? Iniquity. iniquity. The iniquity is, departing from iniquity is your key to freedom. I don't care what anybody else says, anybody teaches. Let he that nameth the name of Christ Depart from iniquity because you can have all the gifts flowing. You can know the Bible from backwards to forwards. You can do great works. You can have a great title. You can have a name that you're alive. But unless the Lord knows you, unless the Lord knows those that are his and you've departed from iniquity, 
you know, it's not going to work out in the end. All right. So now let's look at the antidotes for iniquity. If we want to be free from iniquity, if we want to depart from iniquity, if we want to be purified from our iniquity and be zealous for good works, if we want to be cleansed from our iniquity, what are the antidotes for our iniquity? Antidote for doubtful fear. One of my favorite ones is in found in Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. They said, if God doesn't deliver us, you know, we're not afraid of you, right? They were trying to put them in the, the three Hebrew boys in a fiery furnace, right? For not bowing down to the idol. Did they have any fear? No, no they didn't. They didn't ha have any doubt that God was more worth it. Okay. Even if they were to throw and be thrown in the fire, they said, listen, if God doesn't deliver us, we don't care <laughs> because he's still better. Right. That's how much faith they had. Right. So they were ready for God to they were ready to go and be with him. And they were ready to for God to do a miracle and deliver them. It didn't matter either way. Their faith in God was so strong that they were willing to suffer or they were willing to be delivered either way. It didn't even matter. And that's the antidote for, for doubt is to trust. Yeah. Like no matter what happens, I don't care. I don't care if I die. I'm going to obey God. And it's going to work out. If I die, it'll work out. <laughs> if I don't die, it'll work out. It don't matter. I'm just going to do what God said. Imagine if Eve said, you know what? I don't care. Satan, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. What God said, he said, don't eat the fruit. I'm not going to eat it. I don't care. Oh, oh, I won't know something. Oh, I'm not going to I'm not going to be smart if I if I don't eat this. I don't care. I don't care. I'll be done. Imagine if Eve said that instead of saying, oh, that fruit looks good. I'm missing out. Oh, you know what? You know, I need that. Right. OK, so the antidote for doubtful fear is basically just to trust God and do whatever he said. It doesn't even matter if you die. Right, I'm going to do what he said. We have to replace doubtful fear with belief and faith and trusting fear of Yah. Right, the scripture says they overcame him by what? The blood of the lamb, the words of our testimony, and by not loving our life even to the what? To the death. To the death, right? So doubtful fear, that's the first thing. That's the first way to stop the iniquity is to believe and have confidence in God's word. And no matter what happens, you're going to do God's word. Whether you live or die, we're going to obey God, period. We don't care about losing our reputation. We don't care about losing our life. We don't care about losing our, our status. We don't care about losing money. We don't care about being hungry. We're going to obey God no matter what. That's the, that's the first antidote for the first iniquity. And though for lust is to be thankful for what Yah has given you and run away from lust. Okay? We have to run away from excessive desires for more and more. We have to run away. We have to accept creation law limitations. If your stomach is this big, don't lust for more food after that. Right? Just eat enough to be satisfied. Right? If you have one wife, don't lust for somebody else's wife. If you don't have a wife, don't lust for anybody, period. Okay? We have to accept and be thankful for what we already have and then refuse to desire what we don't have unless God has instructed us to work and he's going to reward us with that thing. And that's another thing. We have to have confidence. That's why the doubt goes with the lust because if you doubt that God will reward you for what you're doing then you're going to end up um, lusting after what somebody else has but if you believe God that he'll reward you and he'll reward those who diligently seek him you don't have to covet what somebody else has you can just do it for yourself and believe that he'll reward you or believe that he'll bless you okay another ant antidote for lust is to Honor your father and mother. When you honor your father and mother, you're honoring the greatest gift that God has given you. You're honoring the one that he is giving you your talents. He's giving you your looks. He's giving you your genetics. 
He's giving you everything through your father and mother. Your calling is probably 90%, half 50% what your father was called to do and 50% what your mother was called to do, right? Your talent, your body type, everything is 50% of your father and 50% of your mother. So when you honor your father and mother, that's the key to success in life. Because everything that God gave you, he gave it to you through your father and mother. Okay? Accept your limitations and enjoy your own portion. What's the antidote for pride? Okay? What does Satan say? Lucifer, when he was in the God's presence, he said, I will ascend. He wasn't satisfied with just worshiping the most high. He said, I want to ascend. I want to ascend higher. So what's the, the antidote for pride is, is what? Instead of I will ascend, say I will lower myself. Mm -hmm. I will humble myself. Always go to the lowest point. Don't try to rise up past somebody else. Humble yourself and become a servant. That's what Jesus did. Okay, he was in heaven. He came, he put himself down. Everybody say, I will lower myself. I will be a servant. I will be obedient. The key to avoiding pride is to lower yourself and be a servant and be obedient. Another antidote for pride is being thankful and content with your natural talent, your natural beauty, and your natural personality that God has given you. You don't need to go higher than that. You don't need to go lower than that. Just be content with what he has given you. Okay? Be content in your God-given place of worshiping and serving him. Okay, don't try to rise to a higher place. Just be content and be obedient. Okay, the antidote for envy. Antidote for envy is to be thankful and use what you have to obey God. Okay, be thankful and use what you have to obey God. <clears throat> Instead of looking at some, what somebody else has, be thankful for what God has given you and use what you have and go work what you have. Right? Instead of envying a shepherd, just... Do what God said and, and watch him bless your crops. Instead of envying the tiller of the ground, <laughs> just take care of the sheep and wait for God to bless you. Okay? It goes both ways. Everything goes both ways. Um, use diligence. In a, um, second way to end up for envy is to boast in tribulations in God's gift, God's goodness. Not in your self. And your success. Okay? Because when you boast in your success, you provoke others to envy. But when you boast in your tribulations, okay, the grace of God can come upon you even on a higher level. Um, third, the other antidote for envy is to use diligence and obedience to creation law. Okay? Creation law gives you, um, it puts you in God's order. Creation law, creation order, it shows that you're satisfied with what God has given you. You know, um, and the creation law is given to us so that we can, so that we don't have to be envious of somebody else. If you're walking in creation law and doing, being diligent in your work, you don't have to cover what somebody else has because you're going to get your own. If you're diligent in the creation law of the tithe and the offering, you're not going to be jealous of what somebody else is called to be because God's going to bless your work. You know, you're not going to have any envy or jealousy of somebody else's position because you're just, you're, you're, you're doing your work and you're supporting and you're playing your role. You know how they say, now stay in your lane. You have to be satisfied in staying in your lane. And when you stay in your lane, you don't, you're not going to fall a victim to envy, the iniquity of envy. Work diligently to have your own and give generously to others. Okay, another satisfaction of creation law is in you know, even the clean, unclean foods. When you're, when you're, um, when you understand creation law about food, it gives you wisdom, and then you don't have to be gluttonous for things that are unhealthy. And when you are not gluttonous for things that are unhealthy, it changes your, um, it changes the way you think, and you start to use food the way it's supposed to be used. Um, even natural beauty, when you're satisfied. With what God, with the looks that God has given you, you don't, you start, you start to, you stop coveting other people's looks. You stop coveting other people's skin tones. You stop coveting other people's hair types, and you start, you start, you stop coveting 
other people's uh, things because you're not envious anymore. Antidote for bitterness. Um, confess your own sins. Um, repent fully and fully renounce sin. Walk in forgiveness just as you have been forgiven. Sometimes bitterness comes from something that says somebody that has sinned against you. Okay? Sometimes bitterness comes from <clears throat> you just being dissatisfied. But we have to, if any bitterness in, in, is in us and, and dissatisfaction with God's order, we have to um, repent from those things and be cleansed. Um, be content with your gift, talent, and place in God's order. Okay? Be the best that you can be and support others with your whole heart. You can get rid of bitterness by being content, being the best that you can be, and supporting others. Taking your role on the team. Taking, staying in your lane. Using your gifts and your talents to support others. To serve others. Okay? Antidote for rebellion is submit to God's order. Be patient. Don't get ahead of God's order and timing like Saul did. Okay? Rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. He walked in witchcraft because he wasn't patient with God's order and God's timing. He wasn't just satisfied with being the king. He had to be the king and the priest. He had to push everything. Right? Accept your role in life under God-ordained authority as a servant, a wife, a citizen, an employee, a disciple. Okay? Whatever God has called you to be, be satisfied with that. And don't usurp authority or, or, or get ahead of God's timing. Okay? Um, do what God says and learn why later. That's another antidote for rebellion. It's just to obey God. Do what he says even if you don't understand why. Because that will help you to depart from iniquity. Another thing we have to talk about is Daniel 4.27, which is another scripture. Um, about concerning the people that become rich from iniquity. And there's a lot of people that become rich from iniquity, right? The entertainment industry is full of them. They see these, because iniquities are in our heart, and you can make money by understanding what people have in their heart and then playing on it, using it to entertain people, <coughs> right? Um, you can get rich from iniquity by being covetous, right? And starting wars with people um, and stealing, right? And the scripture said in Daniel 4.27, it says, Wherefore, o, o king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. So you can break off your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Why? Because the poor suffer from greed. The poor suffer from your covetousness. Okay, so if you've gotten wealthy and rich off of a wicked industry, like Zacchaeus in the New Testament, he was a tax collector. He had been profiting from a wicked system for years and years. Okay, he had defrauded people. And the first thing he said when Jesus came to him is, Oh, Lord, I'm going to come up to the front and pray this prayer. Is that what he said? No. <laughs> the first thing he said when Jesus came to him is, Lord, I'm going I'm to follow you. I'm going to be your disciple. And I'm going to become a member of your church. No, he didn't say that. He said, Behold, everyone, I will give half of my goods to the poor. And everyone I have defrauded, I will give them four times that. Okay. So he understood this, that you have to get rid of your iniquities by giving to the poor. You have to forsake the wealth that you received from your iniquity. Okay, you have to give it directly to the poor and directly to the people that you, uh, that you took it from. Okay, so we talked about how Cain and Abel... Um, Understanding creation law and submitting to creation law can protect you from iniquity. If Cain had just submitted to the tithe and the offering and given the offering instead of being envious of his shepherd brother, then he would have been free from that iniquity. He wouldn't have gotten into bitterness. He wouldn't have gotten into murder. 
Okay? And that's the simplicity of creation law can keep you from iniquity and prevent the spread of iniquity. Okay? And Adam and Eve. Okay? What if Eve, instead of listening to the serpent and letting him sow doubt into her mind and letting him sow lust into her mind, um, pride, the pride of wanting to be higher, right? what if she has just submitted to her husband and said, you know what? Um, I know you're talking about this iniquity stuff, but my husband said, I can't do it, so we're not going to do it, right? If that, if she had just done that, then she would not have fallen a victim to her, those iniquities. And so submitting to creation law, submitting to creation order, those are simple way, simple things that protect us from iniquities. Okay. Let's go to uh, First Kings. So, Eve, Adam, and Eve is Eve is the example of doubt and pride. The first two iniquities, the first twins. Cain is an example of envy and lust. Okay, if Eve has submitted to creation order, then we could have prevented those iniquities, the first two iniquities. If Cain has submitted to uh, natural law concerning the tithe, then we could have avoided the second two iniquities of envy and lust. Now let's go to 1 Kings and see another example. Okay, there was this um, King David. He was old, stricken in years. First Kings chapter 1. They sought for a fair damsel, verse 3, and bought Abishai, the Shunammite, and brought her to the king. Okay, but he knew her not. He didn't have sex with her, right? Because kings just, we talked about a little bit about this last week, but they have... They disobeyed creation law, right? And they just had as many wives as they wanted. Um, and they, they suffered a lot for that. And their families suffered. And we're going to see a little bit about that right now. Okay? But David, he was so old, he didn't even he didn't even do anything, right? In verse 5, Then Adonijah, the son of, son of Haggith, exalted himself. What does that sound like? Satan. Pride, right? The pride of Satan. He exalted himself. Okay? He exalted himself. That's the iniquity of pride. He said, I will be king. I will be king. What does Satan say? I will ascend. I will ascend to the heights. Okay? Adonijah said, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Okay? And so... Adonijah, guess who Adonijah was the brother of? Absalom. Absalom. Dun, 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 dun. So Absalom was the brother of who? Tamar, right? And so, because David, we talked about the iniquities of the fathers coming to the children, right? David was of the tribe of Judah, and Judah goes way back. He was the first son of Jacob to basically act a fool, right? Concerning sexual sin and concerning greed. Okay, we talked about that a few years back, about the iniquity of Judah, right? But David was of the tribe of Judah, and David continued in that sexual sin, having multiple wives, slept with Bathsheba, killed, her, killed, killed Bathsheba's husband, and married Bathsheba. Okay, so that's all types of iniquity. Um, Greed, envy, lust, pride, okay? And so the curse on David's house was that the sword would not depart from his house. So what happened? Um, Absalom ended up being the person to try to destroy David, okay? And Adonijah is Absalom's brother. That means Adonijah's sister was the one who got raped, too. Right? And so 
Adonijah is doing basically the same thing that Absalom did, saying, I will be king. Okay. Now, the next thing that happened, of course, was that David, somebody told David, and David stopped the plan. All right. And then if you look, so David stopped the plan and then Solomon became king, right? Solomon was son of, of Bathsheba, right? Now let's go to chapter 2. Actually, let's go to... Chapter 1, verse 51. So after Ad after Solomon became king, Adonijah became scared because he knew that he, he tried to become king. And since Solomon became king, Solomon was probably going to try to kill him because of, because of his rebellion. Right? And so Adonijah ran to the temple. Verse 51. It was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah feareth King Solomon. For lo, he hath caught hold on the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear unto me today that he will not slay his servant with the sword. And Solomon said, If he will show himself a worthy man, there shall not inherit him fall to the earth. But if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall die. So Solomon said, Listen, I'm not going to kill you. You show yourself a worthy man, you'll be all right. But... If wickedness is found in you, Hello. you shall die. Okay? So, Adonijah, pride, I will be king. Okay? Envy, taking somebody else's position. Right? Um, lust, trying to gain somebody else's position. Okay? Now it didn't work. Now look at the next chapter, chapter 2. Adonijah, the son of Haggith, verse 13, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. She said, come and stop peaceably. He said, peaceably. He said, moreover, I have somewhat to say unto thee. So he's trying to still find some way <laughs> to get what he wants. Verse 15, he said, thou knowest that the kingdom was mine, and all Israel set their faces on me, that I should reign. Howbeit the kingdom is turned about and has become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. Notice those last words. It was his from Yahuwah. He knew that God had given the kingdom to his brother. But instead of being satisfied, he wanted to take it for himself. And guess what? He's still bitter because he's saying, listen, the kingdom was mine. Everybody, All Israel came to me and I was going to reign. Everybody wanted me. So, <laughs> so he's still bitter about it. He still has some kind of bitterness because in his head the kingdom was his but God but the Lord gave it to his brother instead so that's iniquity in his heart and he doesn't even know that his iniquity is about to get him killed again and he said now I ask one petition of thee deny me not she said unto him say on speak I pray thee unto Solomon the king for he will not say thee neither he give me Abishag the Shunammite to wife now who was Abishag the Shunammite the form that they gave to David. So he still wants his he still wants the king's the king's last wife. He wants something that somebody else has. Okay? Because David's dead at this point. David is dead at this point, right? So he still wants Abishag. He still wants some of the property of the king. The kingdom was about to be mine anyway, so at least just give me give me Abishag. Can I just can I just have her? You know, he still has bitterness in his heart. He still has rebellion in his heart. He still has envy. He still has covetousness for someone else. Okay? Now Solomon, he knew what was going on. As soon as he heard the request, he was like, oh, he's about to die. Because <laughs> he, saw, he saw the wickedness in his heart. Why? Because he understood iniquity. He said, if he still has a desire to take something that's not his from me, that's iniquity. And he's going to die. And he literally killed him that day. Why? Because he had already said, the moment that wickedness is found in his heart, he shall die. So they understood what iniquity was. They understood that when you 
desire to take someone else's life. That's the sign of iniquity. When you desire, um, when you have rebellion in your heart, they saw these things and they understood that those things grew and grew and grew. The pathway of iniquity, it never stops. If you stay on it, it will never stop. Okay? <clears throat> so Adonijah, he had pride. He had envy and lust. He had bitterness and rebellion. Okay? So where did this come from? This all came from David. The curse came down from David. And then when when Absalom, right? When Absalom and Adonijah's sister was raped. Okay? The bitterness led to rebellion. The bitterness led to rebellion. And two brothers, instead of walking in forgiveness, they kept their bitterness. And it led to two different brothers turning into rebellion. Bitterness and rebellion. So the wisdom is that forgiveness and repentance sets you free from the sins that were done against you. See, part of the way we have to, one of the ways we have to be free from our iniquities is walking in forgiveness. And walking in repentance. Repentance and forgiveness. If we walk in repentance, it sets us free from iniquity and walks, helps us to have mercy. But we also have to walk in forgiveness. Why? Because a lot of the iniquity and the witchcraft that we have in our hearts it comes from sins that were done against us. It comes from, you know, the traumas that we faced. They weren't even our fault. I'd be mad if my sister got raped too, right? You know, I'd be mad if my, my father was a king that had 18 other wives and I didn't get any attention. That was, that, I'd be mad. It's like the divorce, the fatherlessness. These are the things that cause our generation to be filled with iniquity. Okay, but we have to find repentance for our own sin, number one. And we also have to find forgiveness for the sins of others. He needed to forgive Absalom and Adonijah needed to forgive their father David. Absalom and Adonijah needed to forgive Amnon for raping their sister. Okay, it doesn't mean that forgiveness doesn't mean that the person is not going to be punished for their sin. Forgiveness means that you're set free. Okay? So forgiveness and repentance sets you free from sins that were done against you. But bitterness and rebellion keeps you bound to the sin. When you walk, when you refuse to forgive, okay, it keeps you bound to the sin. It keeps you bound to the iniquities. It keeps you bound to the demons that came in. Okay? Um, envy of what Yah has given someone else causes you to lust after what they have. Okay? But contentment and thankfulness for what Yah has given you causes you to increase. So what if Adonijah was, instead of trying to take what he had, what, what Solomon had, because he was envious of Solomon, what if he said, you know what, I'm going to work hard on my own land and I'm going to be blessed? He wouldn't have got killed. He would have found his own wife. His own property would be blessed. Okay. What if Cain had decided, you know what, I'm just going to work my property, give a tithe and offer, offer it to God every year, and we'll be good. God would have blessed his land so much. Instead, he became a vagabond, wandering over the earth with no land. Okay. There's a, there's a lot of vag spiritual vagabonds <laughs> in the body of Christ today. Okay, don't want to submit to nothing. Don't want to submit to no commandments. Don't want to submit to no order. Don't want to submit to their place. They have a vagabond spirit just like Cain because they refuse to submit to the order of God, the natural law and the natural order of God. Okay, and they see themselves as free, but really they're bound by iniquity. They're in the bond, the, the bond, the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. Walking around talking like they're free, but they're still bound. Okay?
we need to make sure that we are content and thankful for the place that God has given us, the gift that God has given us, the calling that he's given us, content with our place in his order, and God will cause us to increase. So is it better to increase in what you have or to be a vagabond? Who wants to be a vagabond wandering like Cain? Who wants to be fruitful in their gift? Who wants to be fruitful in their talent? Who wants to be satisfied in their place? Okay, and have eternal rewards. Okay, so we can choose the way of Cain. Or we can choose obedience and submission. We can choose the way of Adonijah. Or we can walk Adonijah and Absalom. Or we can walk in forgiveness. We can choose the way of Cain and walk in envy. Or we can be content and walk in thankfulness. We can choose the way of Absalom and Adonijah. Walk in bitterness and rebellion. Or we can choose the way of forgiveness and repentance. We can choose the way of Eve. Okay? Doubting God's word and walking in pride. Or we can choose the way of obedience. Okay? Submitting to God's word. Being confident in his word only. No matter what. We can choose the way of Saul. Okay? Walking in this disorder. Disobedience. Bitterness. Rebellion. Witchcraft. Or we can walk in God's way. Okay, so there's several instances where we can fall a victim to iniquity, right? The younger brother, you know, the scriptures in the Bible are about the younger brother, the older brother, Jacob and Esau, right? Right? Wasn't that some beef? The younger brother and the older brother? Okay, Cain and Abel, right? The younger brother... Why does the oldest get the birthright? I want to take it from him. I want the birthright. That's, isn't that why Jacob and Esau became enemies, right? Okay, because that one wanted what the other older, the younger brother wanted what the older one had. Okay, the elder brother right, can be envious of the younger brother. Why does everybody treat him like a baby, and I just got to do wake up and do work? I got to do chores, and everybody just holds him and. And just said, "Oh, baby, he gets to he gets to should be treated like a baby." And I just gotta work, get up, and do homework and and chore work and school work, right? Okay, there's there's always opportunities for us to fall into envy. You know, I was the oldest brother, and sometimes I was kind of mad, like, "Why do they get to do what they want?" <laughs> and I gotta be all responsible. It's hard. Okay, so it's easy for the younger. To be envious of the elder, and it's also easy for the elder to be envious of the younger. And it's easy for the middle to be envious of both. both. Right? Because they don't get nothing. They they don't get the full responsibility and they don't get the full baby treatment. Right? They're in the middle. But these are the things that we have to understand if we want to be free from iniquity. We have to be content and be satisfied. Okay? The woman. The woman can be envious of the man. Why did he get to be the leader? I'm smarter than him. Why did he get to, 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 to say what he wanted to say? Why did he get at the rule? Why is he the leader? Why does God want him to be the leader? I'm, I'm more capable. I'm smarter. Right? And then the man could be envious of the woman. Why everything got to be my fault? No matter what happened, it's always my responsibility. God's always telling me it's my fault. I, I'm the one with responsibility. They get to, they do all that. They, they do everything they want to do, but they don't get the blame. Everybody blames me. Okay. Everybody has to be content with who they are and satisfied with their role if we want to have freedom from iniquity. Okay. Cain, why do I have to worship God through a shepherd? Okay. Abel, why do you get to to make all the crops he can? I gotta watch these stinky sheep. And suffer. I gotta kill all these sheep and, and raise them and raise them up to kill them. He just gets to plant seed and watch his harvest grow every year, right? He gets to get rich and wealthy, and I just gotta take care of these sheep. Okay, whatever. 
whatever you have been called to do in your family, in the assembly, in your job, okay, in your gift, in your talent, whatever you have been called to do, God can bless you when you are content. God can bless you when you are content. God can bless you when you fulfill your role. God can bless you when you stay in your lane. God can bless you when you are not envious of what somebody else has, but you're confident in what he has given you. You're confident with what his word says to you. When you're confident and you're thankful, okay? Everybody say, envy does not beat thankfulness. Envy does not beat thankfulness. And using your own gifts in your own position. Okay? We talked about Bible examples. Now I know y'all love the sports examples. <laughs> now, um, the, the couple of the best players in the NBA, Nikola Jokic, he's like seven foot tall. He's 200 and something pounds. He's like big. He's not even slim, right? He's a center. Okay? But instead of being jealous of a point guard who's small and, and quick, he just developed his own skill. Now he's almost the MVP of the league because he was satisfied with what God had given him and just developed it. Okay, he was thankful for his own talent. He worked at it. And now he gets to do whatever he wants on the court, not because he was envious of somebody else's skill, but because he used his own. Okay? Another great player in the NBA, Giannis Antetokounmpo, seven feet tall, right? He didn't say, I want to be a point guard. He just developed his skill, and now he's the MVP, okay? You get more results. You get more blessings by playing your role well than you do by coveting someone else's role. You get more blessings, you have more peace, you have more success, you have better results if you play your own role well, rather than being envious, rather than being in bitter that you're not somebody else. If you want to have success, be content, be thankful, be satisfied, and follow God's commandments. Okay? The pathway of iniquity. Doubt leads to pride. Pride fails. Okay? After pride fails, obedience wins. Then, when obedience wins, envy comes, right? When you see somebody else succeeding, and when, you, when your doubt and your pride fail and you see somebody else succeeding at what they did, then you become envious of what they have. Then envy leads to lust. Okay? Then lust fails. Your desire for somebody else's thing fails. Okay? Just like Adonijah, his lust, his envy of his brother that was called to be king, failed. And then his lust failed. And then bitterness set in. And then he tried to come up with another way to rebel and to get what his brother had. Okay? So, doubt leads to pride. Pride fails. Obedience wins. Then when you see somebody that's walking in obedience and they won, now, that, now you're envious because you didn't do what they did. Okay? Then envy leads to lust. Then lust fails. Okay, you want what somebody else has that fails, but obedience wins. Okay, then bitterness sets in. Bitterness leads to what? Rebellion. Then you become a witch walking in rebellion, and rebellion loses. After rebellion loses, obedience wins. And so if you don't choose, if you don't choose to walk in contentment, if you don't choose 
to walk in thankfulness. If you don't choose to walk in the order of God, the law of God, the, the uh, commandments of God, then you'll spiral down the path. Okay, doubt, pride, envy, lust, bitterness, and rebellion. We have to choose thankfulness. We have to choose submission. We have to choose repentance. We have to choose forgiveness. Okay? So the, that's the pathway of iniquity. That means the final solution for this is obedience to the Word of God. Confidence to the Word of God. Everything leads back to the Word of God. If you want to get out of this, the pathway of iniquity, if you want to get out of the pathway of iniquity, it's going to lead you up to submission. Okay, it's going to lead you up to forgiveness. It's going to lead you up to satisfaction. It's going to lead you up to contentment. It's going to lead you up to humility. It's going to lead you up to faith in what? The Word of God. Okay, you can backtrack off the path of iniquity. You can work your way up all the way to the point where you believe God and you're willing to die to do what the word of God says. That's the final boss. You know how I say video games. You can beat this level and then you beat the final boss. The final boss down the pathway of iniquity is when you beat uh, when you beat um, rebellion and you start to walk in satisfaction and contentment. Then you the next level is you you beat bitterness and you start to walk in forgiveness. Then you you beat lust and you start to be content and satisfied then you be envy you start to be thankful for what god has given you honor your father and mother then you be pride you start to lower yourself and not try to ascend above what god has given you and then you be doubt and you start to believe god and then the final level is when you have total confidence and obedience to the word of God. That's when you beat the final boss of iniquity. And now you're on the path of life. When you obey God no matter what. If you don't understand it. You obey it. If you don't like it. You obey him. You submit to his commandments. You submit to his laws. You can submit to his ordinances. You submit to creation law. Okay. You do what he created you to do. And you have total victory. The, the final solution is that everything goes back to confidence in the word of God. Confidence in the commandments of God, confidence in creation law, and the order of God. Okay? That's why the spirit of Jezebel is so pre prevalent in the beginning and in the end. Because the final step is basically just submission to the order of God. And having confidence in the law of God. And that's when power breaks out. Okay? To rule over the nations. Power breaks out to have, to have the morning star. Okay? Those that are still in envy and bitterness, those that are still in the bond of iniquity, they look at people that have confidence in God's word and look at it as a form of pride. It's a twisting. Okay? But the real confidence, the real pride, is when you don't believe God's word. When you doubt God's word, that's when pride comes in. When you believe God's word and you have confidence in God's word, that's not pride. Okay, that's humility because you're putting his word above your own. You're putting his thoughts above your own. You're saying, God said this, so we have to do it. Even if we don't like it, that's humility. That's not pride. But when somebody has confidence in God's word, those that are still in the bitterness of iniquity will say, oh, he's so prideful. He's obeying God's word. He thinks he's... He thinks he's so good. He's obeying God's word. That, and they start to see that as pride they, because they're still in iniquity and their hearts are twisted. Okay? Iniquity makes you blind. Why else would Cain refuse to submit to what God said and kill his brother instead? Iniquity makes you blind. Why would Aslam try to take over a kingdom that his father, that God gave to his father? Why would Adonijah um refuse to just admit that Solomon was going to be the king to the point where he would, even after he got defeated, he would try to take um, 
he would try to take uh, Abishad to Shunammite. Why would he do that? Because iniquity makes you blind. Right? Why would Eve just straight up disobey and listen to the devil? Disobey God even though her husband and God told her the right thing. Why? Because iniquity makes you blind. And so we have to get back to the word of God. Um, in reality, confidence in God's word is humility and selflessness because it elevates his word above our own conceits, feelings, and ideas. Okay, we're not, we're not walking in our own ways. We're walking in his ways. Um, and ultimately, like we said, we have to have confidence in God's word to the point where we're overcoming by the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and not loving our life even to the death. Because that's the solution. The solution to everybody's problems and being free from iniquity is to walk in his word. Okay, to be depart from iniquity and to walk in his commandments and walk in his order naturally and spiritually. And that's where hope is. Right, that's where life is. That's where freedom is. Okay, because we can have all the signs and wonders. We can have all the miracles. We can have all the prayer meetings and know the Bible back and forth. But if we don't depart from our iniquity and walk in God's ways, um, you know, it's not going to work in the end. Because he can, he can say, depart from me. My father never knew you, you that worked what? Iniquity. So as you pray for people, as you intercede, okay, as you begin to lead and disciple people, okay, realize these things. Realize this is the way. This is the way forward because the last scripture I'm going to read is Jeremiah 23, 22. It says, If they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. You know, a lot of times, When you pray for people, God will give you the answer that they need. And this is the answer that they need to turn away from iniquity. So if you pray for people, God's going to give you the answer. And the answer is going to be turn from your iniquity. People don't understand iniquity. They don't want to hear about iniquity. When you start talking about iniquity, people start hating it. <laughs> The demons in them start, uh, uh 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 don't do that. I don't feel peace with that. Uh-uh, no, no, that's negative, right? That's negative, <laughs> right? And so we end up with a, a whole group of quote-unquote believers that have never even confronted their own iniquities, never went through forgiveness, never went through repentance, never went through deliverance, never went through healing. And they baby their iniquities instead of, cleansing them and so there's a lack of understanding of the commandments of God there's a lack of understanding of the order of God there's a lack of understanding of the law of God because so we're so bound to these iniquities and the danger is that if we don't set this generation free from iniquity there's going to be a lot of disappointed people on judgment day so as you pray for people realize that this is the only way this is the pathway of life. Getting away from every iniquity and going back to complete confidence, complete submission to the Word of God in every area of life. Amen? Amen. Amen. I know that was a long, heavy, heavyweight <laughs> message, but you know, we had to to, to finalize this this series, this capstone. Um, because all those key scriptures have the word iniquity in them from the beginning to the prophets to the end. You know, even Jesus himself, depart from me, you that work what? Iniquity. And these are people that did miracles, signs and wonders, and cast out devils. But they left those iniquities. The foundation of God stand sure. Okay. Hold on, I'm going to read that scripture again. <laughs> Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. This is the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Okay? You can say, I never knew you, 
Or you can say, I know you. Let and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And we have been given the grace to depart from iniquity. We have been forgiven of our iniquity. We have been cleansed from our iniquity. But we have to walk it out and walk in purity. Okay? So your way to freedom is the path of life and away from the path of iniquity. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for giving us the keys to freedom. We thank you for giving us the way to freedom. We thank you for giving us the pathway of life. Um, that as we walk in the gospel of your kingdom, as we keep your commandments, that we'll be free from our iniquities, Father. That we would get rid of all these things that hold us back, Father. That we won't go come up to your throne and say, and here you say, you never knew us, Father, but we will be free. In our hearts, in our souls, in our minds, we will give up rebellion. We will give up uh, bitterness. We will submit, submit to our place in your plan. We will give up uh, lust. We will give up envy. We will be satisfied and content. We will give up pride. We will give up doubt. Father, we will have complete confidence in your word and lower ourselves. In, in humble service and obedience to your word. We bless your name. In the name of Yeshua, amen. amen.